Once again, there are handouts up here at the front. They are very, very, very simple, just in case you wanted to take some notes. Um, if you don't want to, that's totally fine. If you just want to kind of watch and listen, that's totally, totally okay. But if you want something to take some notes on, uh, go ahead and, and, and grab. Um, I'm not going to spend really any time at all in the biblical text unless y'all push me to it and, and want me to address something in the biblical text. Um, it's chapters 6 through 9 of Genesis. The flood itself is 6 through 8. Then in chapter 9, you get the aftermath of the flood account with uh, the rainbow and the, uh, uh, the Noahic covenant, which is the most breathtaking of all the covenants that God has ever made. Um, in, in one sense, in another sense, the covenant to send the Savior is the most breathtaking because of its love. But the Noah Noachian covenant is with not only humans, but with all of nature, and uh, which is somewhat breathtaking in its breath. So um, most of this is going to be just me kind of talking through pictures. Please feel free to raise your hand anytime you want to. Um, I will say this was the, one of the very few times I have missed being a seminary professor. Uh, I loved teaching Genesis 6 through 9. It was so fun. Um, if you saw my, my computer Bible, the amount of notes I have on Genesis 6 through 9 are ridiculous. So I'll try not to geek out on y'all today. Uh, you may got blessed by the fact that I have a cold and don't have quite the same energy that I usually usually have. The great flood. Why the flood? Uh, Genesis 6, 11 to 13. Now the earth was corrupt. You have a similar thing that comes in Genesis 6, the early verses. But the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. Note just the all-encompassing nature of this. And if you continue to read in chapter 6 and chapter 7, uh, you hear the word all, every, over and over and over again. All life was destroyed, every person. Uh, the waters covered every mountaintop, etc., etc. It's over and over again. God wants there to be no doubt that this was an all-encompassing worldwide flood. Because one of the falsehoods that's out there is that the flood was only a local thing. And that it was a big flood, and so it got into people's memories and became kind of a legend. Um, but they, they, most people would say that it is a local flood. God does not say that. God says this was a worldwide flood. Uh, we'll talk more about that as we go along. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And so Noah and his family are going to be the only ones on, uh, on the ark, the only ones who are saved from it. This is a key thing in regards to a whole lot of stuff. It means that every person on the earth traces their lineage back to Noah. That means that you and I are cousins and brothers and sisters and etc. Now, we're very, very distant cousins, okay, is the likelihood, but every one of us is a cousin to each other because every one of us traces our lineage back to Noah. The miracle is that within Noah's family, God put the DNA for every kind of people group that exists. It's just that over the course of time, we've separated into groups and become various people groups the reality is we are all one family. Uh, Ned. There's a lot of discussion as far as how many people were on the earth. Going to get to that. Okay. Hold that question. It's towards the end. Uh, there's a question on that towards the end of it. It's a great question. Thank you for bringing it up. So it's going to be hard to see it, but this is from the parking lot right back there, way off in the distance. Is, uh, is the ark. And I just wanted to give you this picture to see even from, I don't know, this was, I'm looking at my wife, mile away? I'm guessing, I don't know. I'm not good with distances. Here we're starting to walk a little bit closer to it. And just the size of it is breathtaking. You can see the people walking around uh, as they're walking up towards, towards the ark. Here's Noah and his wife. <laughs> actual photography there by the way <laughs> so continue to walk close one of the one of the things to note about this picture uh, they've got statues or models made 
of pairs of animals walking towards the ark. I'll try to put my right, right there. You can see a pair of, I don't know if those are camels. I can't quite tell. Uh, one of the things about this picture is it's probably a little inaccurate in that the likelihood of adult animals coming on the ark is very slim. Remember what needs to happen after the flood. These animals need to repopulate the earth. So what kind of animals are you going to take? Are you going to take the big old grandpas and grandmas? No, you're not. What you're going to do is you're going to take the very, very young, which helps us with a couple of things. Number one, it helps us to understand how they could do this. And number two, it helps us to understand how Noah, and his, or Noah could get all these different animals onto the ark. Brontosaurus was huge. But little Brontosaurus is pretty small. Make sense? And so you put a couple of little Brontosauruses on the ark, or whatever they call it nowadays. I think it's a Patasaurus or something. But yeah, more on that in a bit. Just took this to show the... the it's, it's huge. I don't know how else to put it. Similarly, tried to catch her, capture the length of it on that one. This one is at the opposite end of the ark. And one of the things that they speculate is that Noah built the ark with three keels. Uh, most boats have one keel. Where am I? For some reason, I'm not showing. Oh, wait a minute. Wrong button. Is it this one? Yeah, there we go. Most boats have one keel that runs right up the middle, um, and that's there to help stabilize. But because you need to turn, you can't have three keels. If you don't need to turn a boat, what would you do? You'd probably put three keels on it, particularly if you want to make sure that thing doesn't pitch a lot in the waves. And so I tried to capture, you could see it here a little bit better, but they speculate there was a third keel on that side, or a, a keel there, and, and one on this other side as well. It's a little hard to see because of the uh, concrete stanchions that are there. But that seems fairly good speculation that that, uh, that could have taken place. Finally, we don't know. There's a lot of speculation in regards to this. Um, we'll talk about that at the very end. Mr. Poston. <coughs> Hold that thought. We're coming to that in just a minute. All right? Great questions, guys. So, in fact, it's the very next slide, Mr. Poston. Great job. How large was the ark? The, the question is, which cubit do you use? Um, God told Noah to build the ark 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits tall. You can see down at the bottom the dimensions that they have. The ark that they built is 510 feet long, so which is more than uh, a football field, 85 feet wide, again, more than a football field, 51 feet tall, four stories-ish. Uh, God told Noah to build three decks. Does that mean that there was four stories or that there was three stories? Probably three, um, but it may be a little bit questionable. So, what exactly does that mean? You see over here on the bottom right, what is a cubit? A cubit is the distance from your elbow to the tip of your finger. That's what a cubit is, okay? Now, we have different sized people here in the room, don't we? If me and little Milena Poston put our cubits up, hi, Milena. <laughs> if both me and Milena put our cubits up, Milena and I would have a very different cubit, right? And that was the case. And so eventually they standardized the cubits, but there was two kinds of standards. Uh, one was an 18-inch cubit, which is usually what we use as our dimension. So generally, we will say that the arc was 450 by 75 by 45. However, later after the flood, the royal cubit became the cubit that was standardized for most big building programs. And so they speculate that already before the flood, that royal cubit might have been the cubit that was used. And that cubit is 20.4 inches long, and that would yield you the 510 by 85 by 51. All right, I see Kim, and then back to Mr. Poston. 
<laughs> Lexi wants to know where they got all the wood. Yeah? Yeah. And the, the wood is one of the big questions about the ark that we don't have a lot of answers to. Because God tells him to make it out of gopher wood. What is gopher wood? Good question. Gopher, as in like the little animals that run around on the ground. Um, God told him to make it out of gopher wood. Nobody knows what gopher wood is. So is it sim most people will guess it's maybe similar to cypress or pine or something like that. So Alexi, he probably cleared a forest um, or a good chunk of it. And uh, yeah, this was some serious, serious work that took place in order to uh, make that happen. I've got a couple slides on how they speculate the ark might have been put together in just a minute. Mr. Poston, did I address your question about the cubits? Yes? Got it? Okay, cool. Um, let's go on. This is a slide showing the hull. Um, and you notice a couple of things here. Uh, first of all, you see how it's curved. These things here, I think they call them Matisse's, and it's like, I don't even know what, they're like slots of wood that fit together. Um, you also notice, come on, oop, wrong one, there you go. You also notice the dowels at a couple of different places, and they would have also been not only nailed this way, but they've also been down through this way. One of the big problems with long ships is that in the, the ocean, in the currents, they bend. And if they bend too much, the hulls can bust apart and they lose their waterproofness. And so you've got to figure out ways to keep them together. And this is one of the ways they speculate. The next picture is going to be pictures of, of trying to describe how that how that all worked. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a builder. So I can't really explain this anything more than it looks like it would make sense to me. <laughs> um, I don't know. Chuck, what do you think? Does this look like it'd be something that would make sense to you? No idea? No idea? Any shipbuilders in the room? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they, they did it with they did it with multiple layers. Yeah, you were Navy, weren't you, Chuck? Were you Navy? Yes, you, I was. Yeah, okay. Metal ships, not wood ships. Not wood ships, metal. <laughs> old. Not that old. Not that old. <laughs> cool. Uh, you see how they put in that there was multiple layers? Um, you also can see that some of these things of wood would have had to have been bent. And I don't know how that works, but I know you can do that. That if you somehow, if it's you soak the wood and then you know, pull it little by little by little, uh, you can eventually bend, bend wood to make it to be what, uh, what you want it to be. Um, and so Noah probably had to do some of that. Now, there is some people who think that the ark was just a big box, which is possible that it was a big box that was 450 by by uh, 75 by 45, or 510 by 85 by 51. That it was just a big box, because all it had to do was float. Uh, they speculate that it did have more of a, of a hull that came to a point, because they think that that might have been helpful for breaking up waves, things like that. So when you get to heaven, you can ask Noah how he did the building for sure, and we'll find out for sure. One of the illustrations they gave was the, the dimensions of something don't describe the shape of it. So if something is 10 by 10 by 10, that could be a cube or it could be a pyramid. Right? And so either way you look at it, it would still be 10 by 10 by 10. And so their point is that the, the dimensions that are given in the Bible don't necessarily tell us what the shape is. It just tells us what the out, outer dimensions are at the various, various points. And again, another picture of that, just I thought going from, uh, from this picture, seeing the, these things are called tenons and mortises. Oops, I was picturing the wrong one. These things are called mortises and tenons that fit together. 
And so you can see how they would have kind of slotted them together the way you would do like with a prefab wood floor that you kind of fit it together be kind of the same same kind of a kind of a thought the length of it is just breathtaking uh, we're standing about the middle of the ship and you can see on the bottom looking the one way it's almost 243 feet looking the other way it's uh, almost 251 feet it's it's just massive and you see the size of the, the tree trunks that would have been used to hold up the ceiling of the ark. Just a massive, massive structure. And obviously, Beth and me standing in the middle of it just for perspective, it just goes back and back. Notice also this up here. One of the things they speculate is that the middle of the ship was left open, that the decks were around each around both sides, but that they didn't totally come together um, on the second and third deck. Instead, that it was left open. And they think that that was for airflow uh, and for lighting and things like that. Again, put it on your bucket list. When you get to heaven, you'll find out for sure. But common sense-wise, it does make some sense. All right, what are you going to do with all those animals? This is a picture of how they speculate Noah and his family might have kept the, uh, the smaller animals, whole bunch of, of cages, two rows, an upper row and a lower row. Just another picture of it to give you the, the depth and how many of them there were there. They built this, and as they built this and figured out where, you know, of course, this isn't exactly the way it had been. They have to leave huge walkways for crowds of people to come through and, and all that kind of stuff. There's bathrooms in there. Um, there's gift shops. There's, you know, cafes, etc. So a lot of the room is eaten up by stuff. Well, no one in his family wouldn't have had any of that, right? And so the way they figured it was that there was enough room to put some sort of enclosures for every kind of animal that we know of, every kind of animal kind. We'll talk about that more in a couple of minutes. But uh, that every kind of animal kind that we know of, there was enough room to house every single one of them. And one of the interesting things they did was in their cages, they didn't put a lot of animals that we are familiar with. Instead, they put a lot of animals that are extinct. And they did that because they wanted to say, uh, we made this in such a way to cover the biggest possible grouping the worst possibility and it works that you could get every single kind into here even of all these animals that are extinct and so there was some models that they had of animals that that i've never never seen but this is the way they think that they might have been caged uh, just a straight on view of it their thinking is that this here was a feed trough and that this here was water and that like a modern pet feeder where you have a, you know, a food thing and it leaks cat food out little by little by little for the cat or the water drips out little by little by little for the for the dog the cat they think it was exactly the same kind of thing that they did which would have allowed Noah and his family you can see if you go back to this picture you could have gone down this aisle and in you know, 15, 20 minutes, you probably could have filled all the food and another 15, 20 minutes, all the water. And did you have to do it every single day? Probably not. You probably only had to do it, I don't know, once a week, the way you do with your cat dish or your dog dish at the house. So, Kim, does Lexi have another question? <laughs> It's a great bucket list question. She asked, how did the animals not try to fight each other, get after each other? We assume that the animals were pretty well always all enclosed. Um, did Noah kind of compartmentalize stuff so that, you know, the meat eaters were all in one area and the non-meat eaters in another area? Bucket list it. He'll have to find out when you get to heaven. Uh, Margaret. Is 
Not a lot. Uh, God tells him the dimensions, 300 cubits by 50 cubits by 30 cubits. God says he's supposed to build a window or windows. What does that mean? Good question. And there's lots of speculation as to what that could have looked like. I'll show you one example of what they think it, it could have been. He also says to make it with three decks. So we know there was at least three decks, if not four. When he says three decks, is he saying you have a ground floor plus three more decks? Or is he saying there are three decks? I think it's probably the latter, that it's just three. And that's the assumption they went with but it is a little bit open, and there's supposed to be one door. And there's only one door in, into that. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Margaret. We don't have hardly anything like this. In fact, I don't know of anything like this that survives from back then. Um, we have stuff that happened after the flood that we can look at, but we have nothing from before the flood for the obvious reason that it was all destroyed. Now, is it possible we'll find uh, some, um, uh, what's it called, some fossils? It's possible we could find fossils. Say again, Margaret. I guess. <laughs> you know, you, you, you'd assume that God didn't pick out a guy like me you know, who can't do anything with his hands, you'd assume he picked out somebody who knew something. The other thing we don't know is, did Noah do it himself? You know, was it just him, Shem, Ham, and Japheth? Or did Noah hire people? You know, is it possible that part of his, uh, part of his evangelism, part of his outreach to people was hiring local contractors to help him build some of this stuff? It's at least possible. Um, and we also have to understand, God may have given Noah way more detail about how to build this than what's in the sacred text. And that God just knew we didn't need to have it. You know, finally, do I need to know how the wood all fit together in order to get to heaven? I don't. Is it interesting to speculate about and to look at? Absolutely. But at the end of the day, I can go to heaven without knowing exactly how those wood pieces fit together. Make sense? Talk about that the way, way in. I think I saw Mr. Poston. Yes. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, the, he said their point in building this wasn't to say necessarily this is how it was, but to say it could have been done. And this is a way it could have been done. Maybe it was done in a different way, but it could have been done. By the way, how technolog technologically advanced were they? Good question. Already in Genesis chapter 4, it talks about how the people were doing metalwork and how they were building musical instruments. And that's just a couple generations after Adam and Eve. So is it possible that that society was just as technologically advanced as our society is? It's at least possible. Is it even probable? I don't know. Again, bucket list it, and when you get to heaven, you'll find out. But we tend to have this picture of uh, the ancients as being, you know, running around in loincloths and grunting at each other. I don't think we need to have that picture of them at all. How smart would Adam and Eve have been? Oh, my. Now, did they lose a chunk of that with the fall into sin? For sure. But to think that they were dumb is ridiculous. For sure. And there are still things. You know, the pyramids out there. How in the world did people build the pyramids in Egypt? We still don't know how they did it. But they did. And the engineering of it is astounding. And so, uh, how technologically advanced were they already at the time of Noah with the building of the ark? It's a good question. I think thought I saw a hand over here. <laughs> we, 
Well, there's speculation as to how they built pyramids, but for sure knowledge is not out there. Go ahead, Kim. Yeah. So they were on the ark for a touch over a year. I think if I didn't double check this, but I think it's a year and 10 days from the time they went on the ark till God opened the ark up and uh, said to come on out. It's, an, it's a year and 10 days. It's a long time. And uh, so, yeah, they would have had to have a lot of food stored up. Um, I can't imagine how boring that got for Adam and Eve. Not Adam and Eve. Noah and his wife and family. Um, I think I'd have gone a little stir crazy, but they probably had enough work to do with taking care of the animals that it probably was, was okay. But it was a long, long time. So let's move forward on this. This is just a picture of the, what the, they think the smart feeders could have looked like. Again, you've got the food container over on the left there. You've got the water container right there with the animal down there. And these are for the smaller of, uh, of the animals. What about the droppings? Well, this is their speculation. Their speculation is that um, underneath each of the cages, there was a, a piece of wood or something that was angled so that the dropping would have dropped to the middle, gone down, and then hit this board down here at the bottom to bring it out to the edge. And so fairly quickly, you could come by and sweep up after a whole bunch of animals. I don't know. You know is that the, the way it worked? Could be. But again, it goes to show you that it could have worked, that it could have taken place in this uh, sort of way. Uh, Lexi, you just asked about, well, Kim just asked about uh, food storage, water storage. They show a whole bunch of this stuff on, on the, the, the ark. Um, different kinds of jars, and these are, all of these are kinds of jars that you see in, uh, in archaeology. And so these are all things that were there post-flood. Would they have been there pre-flood? It's at least possible. Um, is it possible that they're... Uh, their jars and storage stuff was far more advanced. Did they have a whole bunch of igloo coolers? I don't know. Um, you know, finally, we, we just don't know. Larry? So this may seem like a cop out answer, but if God can choose Daniel to become a grunt and can he keep the lions eating the rabbits? No. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, thank you for that, because at the end of the day, we believe it because God says it, and so God is his way of, uh, of, of making it happen. So, but those are just various storage container things. Uh, the one here is for like grain. Those are like bags, and you could have kept grain in there. This is the door of the ark. There's only one door. It's, uh, the, the, I can't remember if the dimensions are given in the Bible text or not. Uh, if somebody wants to look at it, go ahead and look. I don't think they are. I, my memory is that there was no dimensions for the door. The one they show is huge. You kind of can see here this, the cross. They make a big deal out of the fact that Noah built the ark with only one door and it was going to rescue him and his family. So there's only one way to heaven. I think that's a little bit of a stretch, to be honest with you. But they, uh, they make kind of a deal out of it. There's Bethany standing in front of it. And you notice um, the person who took the picture didn't even catch the top of the door, which tells you how big this thing is. I don't remember if the dimensions are in the text, though. So, Sue. Yeah, when you're reading the Bible, it says it was made of cypress wood. Temple. That the door was made of cypress wood? Yeah, and that's part of the reason why some people speculate that gopher wood was similar to cypress wood because you'd guess they would have used a similar type of substance. But we are told in the text that after they got in, God closed the door and sealed it up. So it did, was that a combo effort that, Moses, or that Noah was sealing it on the inside and God was sealing it on the outside? Could be. You do notice that they used metal here with the hinges, and they, uh, uh, their assumption is that Noah did use some metal on the ark. Let's imagine that that society was more technologically advanced than we think it is, or that it was even similar to what we have today, or even 100 years ago. Noah's Ark out of Gopherwood would look even more ridiculous, wouldn't it? 
What's this crazy Noah guy out there doing building a wooden boat? That's nuts. He doesn't say anything about the size of the door. Okay, thank you, Sue. I didn't think it did. There's nothing about the size of the door. It would have needed to be big enough to get animals in. But if you brought young ones, it doesn't have to be absolutely huge. So that may be a, a speculation there as to how big it is. It is a speculation. So, but is it possible that God told Noah to build it out of gopher wood because he wanted it to serve as a contrast? Yeah, all your wonderful ships that are so wonderful are going to go out there sailing. All of them are going away. This is going to float. <laughs> It would have been yet another example of God using something very humble looking to do something great. I don't know that. Again, bucket list it when you get to heaven. So how do you like this ark? You remember I pointed out earlier that they speculate that the inside, uh, that they speculate that the inside of the, the ark was left open. And here's why. Their speculation, this thing, they have it running the whole length of the, the ark. And their speculation is that it was usually shut, uh, particularly during the flood part, time of the, the, the flood account. Um, it rained 40 days and 40 nights, but then the waters continued to rise for, I didn't double check this chronology, but I think the waters continued to rise for another 110 days. And so the waters were going up for 150 days until they started to go back down. But their speculation is that you could open up that roof. And if you opened up that roof, that would allow light to get down into all of the ship if this is left open. And if you don't have the decks going all the way across, um, or if you have it, you just you've got a walkway to go across, but most of it is, is open. Make sense? So that would make some sense. Otherwise, all they could have used would have been you know, torches or some sort of man-made light is what they would have had to do. I found this to be fascinating. Um, how do you keep the air clean? There, there were a bunch of, there was a couple of different speculations. I'm curious, Chuck, if you've ever seen something like this. Um, if you look right here, this is what's called a moon pool. And you see there's water going up. Their speculation is that apparently they'll do this on ships today. I'm looking to Chuck for confirmation. He doesn't know. Um, that they will leave a hole in the bottom. And then what happens is if the ship goes down into the water more, the water, because water always levels itself, the water would push up into that shaft. And then if the ship lifted, that water would pull out of the shaft. Now what happens as the water uh, goes up and down is it pulls air. And so it would pull in air from up top. It would pull in air from up top as the water went down. And then as the water went up, it would expel air back out. And they speculate that Noah could have put in like a ventilation type system in order to push air, particularly to the lower decks, because it would have been the lower decks that would have had the, 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 the big issue. I've never heard of something like that, but apparently they use this on like uh, oil rigs and on some types of, of ships. Um, has anybody else ever heard of it? I'm not a ship guy at all. And Chuck, you said you've not heard of this, this idea. So, but they said this is something that is used today. Could Noah have done that? Could be. Is it possible that there was some other kind of ventilation shafts that Noah built into the ark to just allow uh, fresh air to come in. It's possible. Again, you'll have to bucket list it. Um, what about clean water? The point is that the water collected on the roof could be funneled to storage tanks, and one inch of rainfall, for, rainfall per week would have kept the cisterns full. You assume that Noah and his family took a bunch of water onto the ark with them. Don't know that. Just an assumption because you need a whole lot of water for the animals and for the humans. Um, during the rain part of the flood, would they have collected it? Did it rain during the 110 days that the ark continued to rise or during the days when the water fell down? We don't know, but it, the, their point is that it would not have been all that difficult to collect plenty of fresh water for, uh, for people to, to stay alive. 
they have a completely, totally speculative take on what the, the living quarters of Noah and his family might have looked like. Um, they've got you know, a, a family area for each of the four families, etc. This is completely and totally speculative, but they put it in there as a reminder that, again, this could have been a very advanced society. And is it possible that they had couches and sofas and rugs and books and et cetera, et cetera? Maybe. <laughs> It's all, all a possibility. I found this to be kind of cool. You notice all the, the boxes with the plants in it? I never really thought about how Noah and his family might have been growing food while they were on the ark. Um, why wouldn't you keep your own vegetable garden on the ark, right? Um, so is it possible that they were growing their own food? Sure. This is their uh, artistic rendering of what it might have been like for Noah to receive back the dove with the, uh, the fresh plucked olive branch in, uh, in his mouth. It's interesting, Noah does not leave the ark. When the dove comes with the fresh plucked olive branch, he then releases that dove again and it doesn't come back. He stays in the ark until God tells him to leave. Uh, probably a confession of faith. God, you're the one who put me in here. I'm not leaving here until you tell me to go. And, uh, and God, at the right time, told him to go and out he, uh, he went. How do we determine the number of animal kinds? This is really interesting because he would not have had to take nearly as many animals onto the ark as what we have today. For example, he only needed to take two dogs. And from those dogs eventually would have bred out golden retrievers and dachshunds and... Um, pit bulls and beagles and yada, 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 as well as coyotes and wolves because they're all part of the same kind. And the way that they determine that is by whether or not the animals can inbreed. If they're able to breed together, uh, then they are part of the same kind. And so because of that, you don't have to have dozens of dogs. You need two. And of course, the miracle is that God brought the pair that had all the genetic makeup to bring all the rest of the, the kinds that are out there, the wolves and the coyotes and the golden retrievers and the pit bulls and yada, yada, yada. Similar with cats. You don't need to take one of every kind of cat family that we know of. You take two of them. And the way they, again, did it was they did worst case scenario. So they, on the ark, they've got like 14 bat species because it's never been proven that those bats can inter, uh, interbreed. They assume they probably can because they're bats, but they don't know it. And so because of that, they put all the different kinds of bats that we know about onto, uh, onto the ark. And they did that with some various other species. I think I saw Larry's hand. Yeah. It doesn't mean that it took, you know, 14 million years. It could have been, you know, what? Anybody familiar with animal husbandry will tell you that it only takes like a few generations to completely change it. one breed of dog to a whole nother. So Noah probably had two anus lupus wolves. And from there, all of a sudden you got poodles and palms and yeah. Newfoundlands and everything. Yep. Yeah, when, when you talk evolution, there is microevolution and macroevolution. And what we have a problem with is macroevolution. Macroevolution is the idea that one kind can change into a different kind. Like, I, it's been a long time since I've looked at evolutionary theory, but it used to be that they thought frogs developed into birds. Well, birds are a completely different kind than frogs are. Okay? And so we have, we are just like, no. And you go back to Genesis chapter one, what does God say? When he talks about the kinds, he says over and over and over again, reproduce according to its kind. The land animals, according to their kinds. The fish, according to their kinds. The birds, according to their kinds. Why? Because God wants it to be very, very clear that animals and plants, as far as that goes, are gonna reproduce according to their kinds. If two dogs mate, what are they going to give birth to? A chimpanzee? 
No. A fish? No. They're going to give birth to a dog. Yes, it may look different than the dog that, that or than the two dogs that bred, or may not. It depends on how close they are um, and what kind of genes they bear and all that kind of stuff. But it's ultimately going to be a dog, not some other kind. We have no problem with saying there's, there's differentiation between the kinds. That's how we ended up with all the various different kinds of dogs. Larry, you want to follow up? We had a dog who was uh, a part beagle, part terrier. She didn't look like either one of them. She, Zelda looked like Zelda. Yeah. 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 Margaret. Was there a fish on the part? Hold that thought. Coming. <laughs> yep. They did. I don't know that I caught it. Uh, Beth, did you catch that detail? Yeah, there was somewhere where they put how many kinds they thought would have been on the ark. And I, I just did not catch that. So I'd have to go looking for that. Sorry about that. And I just took a picture of some of them. This is the istiodactylid kind. And there's what that istiodactylid looks like. How many of you have seen an istiodactylid before? Yeah, I have not, <laughs> hey? Um, and this is an example of one of the kinds that is extinct, but they think uh, very well could have been on, uh, on the ark. Uh, the Macroiconid kind. That looks kind of like some of the animals that we have today, but not the one I've ever seen. I found this one to be very interesting, the cattle kind. Um, those do not look like any kind of cow that I've ever seen. Um, Antelope, gazelle, apparently bison, antelope, gazelle, moose, and cows all are from the same kind, if I understood it correctly. I'm no scientist, and so if I mess up any of the science here, um, apologies, but um, I thought that was just sort of fascinating to, uh, to, to see that. Here's your question about the fish. So how did the freshwater fish survive? They had a couple of different thoughts uh, in, in regards to this. First of all, um, could God have made it that he kept like pools of fresh water somehow together where the freshwater fish could have survived? Sure. The other point they made though, which I thought was probably more, uh, more helpful, was that the oceans back then probably weren't nearly as salty. Apparently the oceans are getting saltier every single year. And so you go back thousands of years to when this would have taken place, the oceans probably weren't nearly as salty. So is it possible that the freshwater fish were able to handle that little bit of salinity? Seems possible. I mean, we know of fish that go back and forth. Salmon, you know, who get, are born in fresh water, swim out, and live most of their life in, in the sea, and then swim back to the freshwater sea, stream in order to breed at the end of their lives. So there are a number of fish that go both directions. Could more of them have happened at that time? Maybe. I see Kevin posted up in the balcony with a hand up. The, the salinity of the ocean, as a side note, is one of the proofs against the billions and millions of years, too, because the saltiness of the ocean is way too low for anything beyond 6 to 10,000 years. The way the saltiness of the ocean is increasing. Yeah, thank you for that, that detail. Did everybody hear what he said? Did you hear it okay? Yeah. Um, and there's a whole bunch of stuff like that out there. Talk more about that at the, at the very end. Did you know up to 85 kinds of dinosaurs were on the ark? Um, and yes, the ark was big enough to hold all of those different kinds of, of dinosaurs. Particularly, if you remember, he probably brought the little ones, not the, the big ones, and that's what this uh, slide was about, that he probably brought the very young animals, because at the end of the day, they had to be fruitful and increase and fill up the earth. So you want very young animals when the flood starts, so that they're of breeding time when the flood comes to an end, so that they can have lots of, of, lots of progeny, and the earth can be refilled with the various kinds. Would they have continued to breed while on the ark? Don't see any reason why they couldn't have. And so uh, there may have been quite a few like 
rabbits, for example. Maybe there was a lot more rabbits at the end of the, the flood than there were at the beginning of the flood. You'd kind of guess. Um, this is kind of getting into some more of the questions that are out there. What about the fossil record? This is a picture of something that was taken out in, I think it's Utah or maybe it's Nevada, uh, uh, a fossil site, and there's a whole variety of different kinds of fish. Um, there are freshwater herrings, uh, temperate basses. I don't know exactly what that means, if that means that they are usually in salt water. Um, but what happens when an animal dies? So if our cat wanders away from the house and goes off and dies, do you expect it to turn into a fossil? No, you don't. What needs to happen for a fossil to form? Things need to be buried fast and under big time pressure. That's how fossils form. And so to see all of these fish in one small area, boom, this came on fast and buried them. And we have all kinds of just interesting fossils. Uh, this baby is 10 foot, seven inches long, that palm front. Wow, and it's buried in that same, same area. Um, this is from Mount St. Helens. And what's happened out at Mount St. Helens, remember that Mount St. Helens earthquake back in the 1980? 1980, thank you. Uh, what happened after that is just kind of fascinating. A mini Grand Canyon formed, a, a, a mini petrified forest formed, etc. And this is an example from Mount St. Helens where you have this tree whose trunk goes through all these different layers of sediment, as evolutionists would look at the Grand Canyon, they would look at the Grand Canyon and say every one of these layers was laid down over millions or even you know, thousands or millions of years, and Mount St. Helens would say, yeah, it took a few months <laughs> that all this stuff took place, and you end up with kind of the same thing. And so when you look at places like like uh, the Grand Canyon, is that a proof for macroevolution that the Earth is billions and billions of years old? No, it doesn't have to be a proof of that at all. It depends on what your presuppositions are, more of that than that. One of the very interesting things out there right now is that it is widely held scientific theory that Mars used to be completely covered with water. Why do they think that? Well, because there are complex channels uh, there are dry river beds that you can see. Them. There are gravel deposits. Um, I can't remember what that one is. Uh, gravel in a stream bed is that one. Oh, erosion. That one's erosion in the bottom. Uh, how many of those things do you see on the Earth? Well, all of them, and very, very clearly, right? Now, how much water have they actually found on Mars? Zilch, zero, nada, nothing. And yet it is widely held scientific truth that Mars was one time covered with water. Ironically, you are considered an idiot because you think that the Earth could have been totally covered with water at one time. When the Earth right now is covered by how much water? Three quarters of its surface. Huh? Now, that being said, there are some significant issues. What if the mountaintops back then were the same as they are now? We have nowhere near as much water on the Earth as what would be needed to cover all of those, those mountaintops. Okay, is that a problem? Not for the God who can keep Daniel from being brunch, right? And who can rise from the dead. A couple of very interesting things that scientists have found recently. They have found that underneath the surface of the Earth, uh, there is a core and I don't thoroughly understand this, but it's like a spongy type substance, they think, and they think it holds more water than all the oceans that we know of today. And it's all underneath the surface of the water, or surface of the earth. Is it possible that part of the flood was God opening up the earth and reforming even the core of the earth? Part of it could be. Uh, they've also speculated that they are now seeing huge group bunches of water out in outer space. I read about that not too long ago. That out there amongst the stars, there is huge masses of water that are, that are out there. Is it possible that part of that strong wind that was 
drying up the earth? Was God blowing the water out into the outer space? Maybe. At the end of the day, do we really care? No. One of the thoughts is that the earth before the flood was all one continent and that a part of uh, the flood was God reconfiguring the earth and making it the continents that we now have. Um, it's also thought that there was a different water system before the flood. When you read Genesis, it talks about how there was no rain on the earth, but streams came up from underneath the surface of the ground and watered the ground. So is it possible that most of the water at that time was underground, under a fairly high degree of pressure? If so, what God may have done with the flood is he may have kind of unzipped the world. And if he unzipped the world, that water would have gone flying up in the sky. Picture geysers, eh? But picture them much more intense than that and all over the place. Can you imagine what kind of rain that would cause? Oh my! And that, that, that rain going up, uh, the, the water pushing its way out, would have in turn pushed the, the continents away from each other, but since the earth is round, what would have eventually happened? Well, the ones that are being pushed this way and the ones that are being pushed this year way would collide with each other, in which case, what would happen? <laughs> Mountains would pop up, you'd have huge landslides that would go away, and then you'd have these gulches where the land used to have been. Is that possible as to how it happened? It's at least possible. You know, that would help us to understand why the oceans are deep. When you look at the mountain ranges on the earth, most of them vaguely run north and south, not 100%, but most of them vaguely run kind of north and south. If it was a collision, what, what do you almost always find next to mountains? Plains, <coughs> long plains. So is that how God did it? Could be. If that's the case, it would not have taken all that much water to cover the whole earth. It just wouldn't have. Because if the mountain ranges at that time, at the time of the flood, were much lower than what they are today, we've got plenty of water. Making sense? It's just how it was distributed. I think I saw Larry. Yeah, well, correct me if I'm wrong, you're the preacher, but on day two, <laughs> Therefore. didn't God create the vault between the waters above and the waters below? Yes. So It's at least possible. There's all kinds of speculation on it. You know, why do you have those huge palm fronds in Utah? Um, that would seem to indicate that the earth was much more temperate, more tropical, uh, more like a, a greenhouse. Is it possible that there was like thick clouds that surrounded the earth at that time? And so that the, there was never rain, but there was just always sort of this mistiness or always this really high humidity that would allow plants to just thrive and grow, maybe. Again, bucket list it, but the fact that it's possible is part of what we want to take away from, uh, from this. Oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to hit one more thing on this. Um, part of the issue with, in regards to all of this kind of stuff isn't what the evidence per se says. The issue in regards to it is what is your presupposition? So if I look at the Grand Canyon and I'm a believer that the earth is five billion years old, ish, whatever, as I look at the Grand Canyon, what am I gonna say? I'm gonna say, look, this took billions of years and you can see it, how this river cut its way little by little by little by little down through this, this layer of rocks until we've got this huge Grand Canyon. If I'm a believer in the flood account and that the earth is only eight, ten thousand years old, I'm gonna look at that same Grand Canyon and go, wow, what remarkable evidence for the flood and how the flood would have cut this through and it wouldn't have taken all that much time and the layers could have been laid down and just, oh, so cool. The evidence is exactly the same. What's the difference? The difference is the presuppositions. What are you looking for when you look at it? And that's really important for us to, uh, to understand because if we try to argue people on the science, 
the science isn't really the issue. The issue is what's in your head and heart. And so therefore, we don't go after people with the, the science. We go after people with the word of God. Jesus died and rose for you. That's what matters. And I believe this because God says it, that God just will not lie to me. And he's not going to lie to you either. So having stuff like this, I'm going to hold the rest of that discussion towards, uh, towards the end. One of the questions is, how could land animals and people reach different places? They speculate that after the flood, that there was uh, possibly an ice age, uh, probably an ice age, actually, because of the way they considered it happened. They think there was a land bridge between Asia and the United States, or the North America and South America, and that people could have traveled through there. They think similarly with Australia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'll be honest, I, I don't know the answers to those questions. Is this possible? It's at least possible. How many people lived on Earth prior to the flood? Um, the Struces had to leave. Mike teaches math, and so I was going to ask him to help me with this slide. Um, if the population growth of the Earth was 1.1% growth per year from the time of creation to the time of the flood, that would put a population of 150 million people on the Earth at the time of the flood-ish. If the population growth was 1.4% per year, that would be a population of almost 20 billion people on the Earth at the time of the flood. Now, I don't know math, I do know the Amway Pyramid. If the people lived to be 900 plus years old, which they did. So today, let's use just, we'll take 10% of that. Most, most people live 89 years. How many years of that time can women have children? 20, 25 years, maybe 30. Let's go to the small end, 20. So let's multiply that times 10. If instead of living 80 years, you live 800, that'd mean you'd have a 200-year period of time during which you could have kids. <laughs> Amy up here said, nope. <laughs> but do the math. How many kids could people have had? Oh, my. And when you think about it that way, the, the, the number of people that could have inhabited the earth very, very quickly is staggering. It really is. And so I can't prove this, and again, it's bucket list, but if, um, and, and that's with a very young age. They use the, they, they go with the speculation that the earth was created about 6,000 BC and that the flood happened about 4,000 BC. I do not agree with that. I think it has to be a little bit, little bit um, older than that, not much, but a little bit. But even using that, that the earth is that young, the amount of people that could have been on the earth is, uh, is, is pretty staggering. And to think that God only found one family to save in that um, uh, number of people is, wow, that tells you something about the world. Now, is it possible that there were other believers who went to heaven through the floodwaters? Yes. God can take people to heaven however he wants. So is it possible there were other believers? It would seem at least possible, if not probable. Uh, but we don't know it for sure. Just know that the, the population could have been pretty huge. Ned, I think you had asked about that. Did I cover what you were going to, to talk about? Yeah, good question. <laughs> yeah, but there's, I mean, there's reasonable speculation on that one. Number one, uh, the carnivores would have had a field day. Uh, the sharks and et cetera like that, they would have had a field day without a doubt. Um, and the other kinds of carnivorous, carnivorous fish. Number two, how quickly would those bodies have, have wasted away um, in floating in the water? I'm no expert on that kind of stuff. Number three, a whole lot of them were probably buried because of the intensity of what this would have been like, it would have been just crazy as the earth is busting forth and, 
and landslides are going and stuff, so a whole lot of them are probably buried. But at the end of the day, good question. Put it on your bucket list, and uh, we'll, we'll find out when we, when we get to heaven. This is a slide that just shows there are flood uh, accounts that show up in native literature all over the world. And it's kind of interesting what the arcs look like in the various flood accounts. I always find this one to be particularly interesting, that the ark in this one is like a big old donut. <laughs> Excuse me, that it's, it's round. But each area kind of has its own shape for the ark. But the bigger question is, why do all these various cultures have in their cultural history some sort of flood account? And most of the times they're really kind of crazy, but it's still got some sort of Noah figure, some sort of flooding, some sort of ark, almost always animals, etc. Why? Because it happened. And this would not have been the kind of thing that would have been easily forgotten. Make sense? Why did the people build the Tower of Babel? I think a part of the building the Tower of Babel was a place to go to in case there was another flood. Well, had God promised there was going to be no more floods? Yes. But the people at the Tower of Babel weren't listening to God anyway, were they? Well, I think part of their building program was that they would have a place to climb to if they had another flood. Speculative. We'll find out when we get to heaven if that's the case. But I think that's maybe one of the things that's going on there. There's certainly they want to make a great name. They don't want to spread out all that. But there are flood accounts from all over the world. Um, this gets really dorky, but there is real... The flood, the, one of the few places where we have an argument with these guys at the flood account is in regards to the age of the earth. They would put the age of the earth as about 6,000 years old, or 8,000 years old, that the creation was about 6,000 BC, the flood about 4,000 BC, maybe 4,500. I don't remember the exact numbers. When you go into the text, we have a real problem. And what they do is they add up these, these numbers and how old uh, Adam was when he gave birth to Seth, how old Seth was when he gave birth to Enosh, and down the trail, which adds up to 1656. The problem we have is, if you look at the Samaritan Pentateuch, the Samaritans, remember, only accepted the first five books of the Bible as Bible. Um, their numbers are about 300 years less. When you look at the Septuagint, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It was done about 300, maybe 200, 200-ish BC, maybe even a little earlier than that, maybe even a little close to the time of Christ. But it was done, um, and, and their numbering system is drastically different. With most of these, they add 100 years to the time of the, the firstborn. So Adam, instead of the Masoretic text, the Hebrew text saying 130 years, the, Samarit, the, uh, the, the Septuagint says 230 years. Seth, 105. The Septuagint, 205. Now, how do we account for these differences? Number one, it could be just scribal error. That's certainly a possibility. Number two, it's possible the Septuagint had a better, better version of the Masoretic text than we have. It's possible. Can you get to heaven and not know whether Adam was 130 years or 230 years old when he had his first son? No, it's not going to bother you a bit. You're going to heaven because Jesus died and rose for you. It's very easy to make mistakes in copying numbers. It's just one of those things that's easier to make mistakes in. Um, Hebrew numbering, it goes by... Aleph equal, it's, it's more like Roman numbering. So the first letter of the alphabet is one. The second letter is two. Third letter is three. Once you get past 10, then you start to, to repeat. And so it can get to be very easy to make a mistake in, uh, in the numbering system. So we would go with an age of the earth that's probably closer to about 10,000 years old. That it just seems like using this system, one of the problems is that uh, Methuselah would actually live five years after the time of the flood. That doesn't work, does it? <laughs> I 
because only Noah and his family were left after the flood. And so there, there are just some discrepancies here that just don't work. One of the things we also don't know is, uh, were all of these always the firstborn son? Or could it have been that it was the second born, or third born, or fifth born, or tenth born? Um, and that he gave that number. And it may not therefore help us to add up the, 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 the years of the earth. Finally, there's just a lot of things we don't know for sure. Uh, the, this numbering system they use is, comes from a guy named James Usher, and it's still widely used. Incredibly well done. Um, he had 2,000 footnotes from non-biblical sources. Did you hear that? 2,000 footnotes from non-biblical sources that he used in his chronology of the, of the world. He was a Protestant bishop in Ireland. I don't remember what year he lived, 16, 17, 1800, something like that. Um, and it's still pretty widely used, but we think there's some, some issues with it. Yeah. What does this mean? Why should we spend time looking at something like this? Well, one of, one of the first things we need to look at is what is science? What is true in science today will be false tomorrow. I'm old enough that I've been taught that Caffeine is good for you, is bad for you, is good for you, is terrible for you, is good for you, is bad for you. How many of y'all have experienced the same thing? Uh-huh. And in the realm of science, that's good. Because if you disprove something, you have advanced things. So the scientist doesn't get bothered by saying things have changed. All right, so how much do we want to rely on science as we talk about stuff like this? Hardly at all. So what is the value of a thing like this Noah's Ark experience? It isn't to say, see, we proved that it happened. Rather, it's to say, see, this is how you can see that this is possible. And what that maybe can do for people is to just open their minds a little bit, humanly speaking. That humanly speaking, they can at least say, oh, okay, I didn't really realize it was actually a reasonable possibility for something like that to happen. Maybe, 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 humanly speaking, that helps people become more willing to listen to us when we talk to them about Jesus. But at the end of the day, our approach to people isn't going to be on the basis of the ages of rocks. Our approach to people is going to be about the rock of ages. We're going to go and talk to people about Jesus and what Jesus has done. Ultimately, I believe that God created the world. I believe that there was a worldwide flood because God says so. And if people say, prove it to me, I say, I, I can't and I don't have to. I believe it because God says it. I think all good science agrees with it. But there's all kinds of things that we don't know. Is it possible that God put an appearance of age into the world when he created it? It sure seems likely. If you'd have seen Adam and Eve on day number eight, would you have gone, hey, those people are two, year, two days old? No. <laughs> you'd have said, hey, those are adults. And if you looked at that fig tree that was blooming on day number eight, would you have said, hey, that fig tree is only four or five days old? No, you wouldn't have. You'd have said, that's an adult fig tree. So did the earth have some appearance of age? We know that it did, just because of the way that it was, was created. How much did the flood change things? I don't know. You know, the, 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 the way they date things assumes that one of the uranium isotopes has always broken apart at the same rate. But what if the world is covered with water at a huge depth and under huge pressure? Could that have changed the way the radium isotope broke up or uranium isotope broke up? Yes, it's at least possible, if not probable. Make sense? So, but ultimately our argument isn't gonna be on the basis of those things. It's valuable for us to know those things just so we can have a reasonable discussion with people. And could say, oh, I, I, 
that's good, but have you ever considered this? But at the end of the day, we're coming back to Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus rose, and Jesus is going to come back again. It's Jesus that we're going to come back to, not these sorts of, sorts of things. The other question that we need to know is, what is the Bible? Um, you notice that over and over and over again, I said, that's their speculation. They think this is how it could have happened. They think this could work this way. But the Bible text just doesn't tell us. The Bible text doesn't tell us how big the doorway to the ark was. The Bible text doesn't tell us how the window was to be built, how to store up the water, how to store up the food, how to cage the animals. The Bible text just doesn't tell us. Would it have been fun to have some of that info? I'd say it might have been. But guess what God knew? You didn't need a word of it. Not relevant. Relevant. There's the word you're looking for. Yep, not relevant. What he gave you is what you and I need for salvation. So there's all kinds of questions the Bible just does not answer. And that's okay. Because these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. God chose to give us huge details on the life of David, chose to give us only this basic glance at the life of Noah. Why? Because God knew that's what you needed. That's what I needed. Very cool. All right, that's the last slide. What questions you got? Thank you for asking them as we went along. What other questions are out there? Yeah, yeah, the, the, the speculation is that more of the water came from underneath than came from above. Um, there is speculation that the rain that fell at the time of the flood was the first time there had ever been rain. And that, that God was allowing the previous water system to collapse and was going to rebuild the water system that you and I know today. And that, uh, so yes, the text in chapter 6 and 7 talks about how uh, the fountains of the deep were opened up and that the waters continued to rise um, for 110 days more after the, uh, the rain stopped. I think I saw a hand. Larry. Again, I'm just picturing that Serco commercial with the giant water balloon they drop on the house. It's, it's, it's like a property restoration company. Maybe it's not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yep, for sure. The other questions? Close us off with one last application. God uses the flood account to talk to us about salvation, not destruction. <coughs> Through the ark, God saved Noah and his family. And as the waters of the flood saved Noah and his family, so the waters of baptism save you. The flood was not primarily about destroying things, it was about saving things. Saving Noah and his family, but more importantly, saving the line of the Savior. If all creation is wiped out, then the line of the Savior goes with and everybody goes to hell. God made sure that the line of the Savior was kept alive so that Jesus could someday come, do what he needed to do, and then God gives it to you in the waters of baptism and compares it to the waters of the flood. 1 Peter 3 is where I'm referencing. What a cool thing. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you saved Noah and his family and thereby saved the line of the Savior with it. We pray that whatever doubts we might have in our hearts, that you would drive them out. Lead us to know that what you say, uh, you, are, you are promising with an absolute assuredness that we might read your text and cling to it and hold it fully. We thank you for the people who give us ideas as to how these things could have happened so that we might have encouragement in our walk of faith. We pray that you'd be with each of us during this week, that we might be your lights in a dark world. In your saving name we pray it. Amen. Thank you, guys. Next week we'll resume our two Bible studies, Philippians and um, the abuse study. Vicar will get back late this week. And we'll see all y'all 
later next week.